The truth of our lives is not always in the stories we tell, but in the stories we leave behind with our stuff. And lives are strewn across the beach at Dead Horse Bay. I've never come across any place like it. It was a site of human tragedy. When you take a step, you're walking on history. It's haunted. Dead Horse Bay is haunted. On the southern edge of New York City, there is a place few have come to know. Once a remote island, home to a massive waste facility, several horse rendering plants, and a poorly constructed landfill, it has become host to an unusual feud among artists, historians, and treasure seekers. Welcome to Dead Horse Bay. To describe the Dead Horse Bay in a sentence would be difficult. I've traveled to over 30 countries in the world. I've never come across any place like it. My name is Gerard Barbeau. I'm an artist. I've been coming to Dead Horse Bay about 25 years. You know, when I first got there, I just wanted a, a sample of everything. There was toy metal uh, figurines and ceramic figurines and dolls and doll heads and everything that we ever used and made in modern civilization was there. You know, this is what we are, the results of what we are. What brought me back to Dead Horse was the sound of glass uh, hitting itself as the tide went in and out, just that tingling sound, uh, like chimes. I just never heard anything like it. It's like the sirens calling you out to sea, almost. Items that I collected at Dead Horse Bay have been used in my art, in my sculpture. And down we go. Did you see this? You know, you're French. The last exit to Brooklyn. I do assemblage, which is just combining found objects and making sculptures out of it. It's just that joy of discovery, of uh, coming across something, and it just, in your mind, you see its potential, and it's the possibilities that combined with another object and another object may transform itself into something new and different, than something we've never seen before. I have shown some of my work in museums, and. Uh, galleries. Uh, right now I'm exhibiting in the, uh, the Brooklyn Waterfront Artist Coalition Spring Show in uh, Red Hook. I found him at the Dead Horse Bay. I don't think of myself as a treasure hunter or a collector. I'm an accumu accumulator, you know, I just uh, take a bunch of stuff and then hope that I'm going to be able to use some of the stuff or if the, it has value to sell some of the stuff even. Didn't I once tell you it was like a bower bird that gets all these like similar colored objects and shotgun shells and bits of plastic and builds a nest to attract female? It seems like I, I do that, I accumulate these things. I don't know why though. I don't think it's just to attract the female. Because most of them find it like dirty or disgusting. <laughs> junk. They see junk. When it's finished and it's on the wall, then they see art. It's funny. And when, you know, people walk in and say, you know, this is junk. Yeah. What are you thinking then? That, yeah, it is. I'm glad you noticed. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's the whole idea, is transforming, the, you know, what's that old saying? One person's trash 
is another's treasure. It's the, it's exactly yeah. I want him to realize it's junk, and but look at it now. Few New Yorkers think of garbage the way Gerard does. For most, it's something better kept out of sight and out of mind, which is easy these days. The local landfills have all been closed, and today, 100% of New York's garbage is exported outside city limits, trucked and shipped off to far-flung places across the country and around the globe. But for people like Gerard, there is still at least one place left in New York where the city's garbage can be found. The story of Dead Horse Bay begins in the mid-1800s, when New York City faced a garbage crisis. Pedestrians walked shin-deep in household garbage, and most of it was either burnt or dumped at sea. Eventually, city officials started looking for a place to put a massive garbage facility, and they came upon Barren Island, a remote tidal archipelago on the southern edge of Brooklyn. Barren Island was always on the outskirts of reputable society. It was a place where Pirates allegedly hid gold, and outlaws could go to escape the law. I'm Robin Nagel, the anthropologist in residence for the New York City Department of Sanitation. Barren Island seemed a logical place to locate what then was called a noxious trade. If you're going to be carving up and boiling parts of horses and other really smelly garbage, you want to put all of that kind of work far from potentially complaining residents. So Dead Horse Bay, Barren Island, was a, was a logical choice. So within the span of just a few years, Barren Island became home to fish processing plants, guano factories, several horse rendering facilities, and the largest waste reduction plant in the world. All of these industries dumped their byproducts into the tide, and locals started calling the adjacent waters Dead Horse Bay. To this day, horse bones can still be found on its shores. The reputation of Barren Island was of a place that you did not particularly want to go to. My name is Lincoln Hallowell. I'm a National Park Service Ranger at Gateway National Recreation Area. Barren Island had a rather awful smell. You know, if you have a strong wind coming out of the south, that odor was drifting through some pretty heavily populated areas. So beginning really in the late 19th century, the people of Brooklyn were clamoring to have all these businesses on Barren Island shut down for no other reason than to get rid of this foul smell. By the 1920s, city officials decided to establish New York's first municipal airport on Barren Island and shut down the noxious industries it had become known for. But the site was still too small to accommodate an airport, so officials decided to make more room by connecting Barren Island to the rest of Brooklyn, using sand dredged from the bottom of Jamaica Bay. The architect for this project was Robert Moses, who perhaps, more than any individual, would forever change the fate of Dead Horse Bay. Robert Moses was the most powerful, unelected man in the United States. My name is Howard Warren, and I'm a retired science teacher from Trinity School in New York City. How are you, Commissioner? Nice to see you again, sir. Robert Moses had the wherewithal to change the map of New York City and make decisions that affected the entire country. He was at one time the head of 12 different city and state agencies at the same time. And by the time he was at the peak of his powers, which I would put in the 1950s, he could pretty much command wherever he wanted a landfill to open. By the 1950s, Robert Moses sought to make New York City a car-friendly metropolis, and he began building an elaborate network of highways connecting the city to the rest of the country. But standing in his way were thousands of people living in the proposed highways routes. So Robert Moses had to get rid of these people in order to build. Now, when you need to displace people, you don't go to wealthy areas. You go to areas where poor people live, neighborhoods like the Bronx, Red Hook, Brooklyn, the Gowana section of Brooklyn. These people were poor. They could not afford the big moving vans to move all of their possessions from one place to another. So in addition to their homes, thousands of evicted residents were forced to leave behind countless belongings. In 1953, truckloads of belongings 
of the people who were displaced were brought out to the shoreline of Barren Island and dumped to expand the shoreline. So all this trash goes to Barren Island and then gets covered up with sand. In 1953, the technology of landfill design was already sophisticated enough that it was far past just dumping it, burying it, and driving away. But for whatever reason, at Robert Moses' uh, behest, at his command, Dead Horse Bay was basically a bunch of household waste, just dumped and then buried. And it has been reasserting itself into the world pretty much ever since. Well, as a result of the landfill never being capped, what was in the landfill is now starting to come out. Every time we have a storm that erodes some of the shoreline, more of the landfill is exposed, and it's, uh, you know, it comes out and it ends up on the beach, and it ends up in the water of, of Dead Horse Bay in Jamaica Bay. It was a site of human tragedy. It's a graveyard of things that people held so close to them in their homes. It made up a quilt of their lives. If you walk Dead Horse Bay from end to end for, let's say, two hours, you can reconstruct a home from the nail polish bottles with the bristles still inside and the eyeglasses and the roller skates and the hair nets and the nylons and the car parts and the and irons for the fireplace. My hope for Dead Horse Bay is that we come to understand the profound value of that material as a record of our contemporary past, that we come to understand that now, that we don't wait until there is a, 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 another century gone. Because I don't know how much of Dead Horse Bay is gonna be left in another century. And it's that fear of losing historic artifacts forever that's given rise to a rather unusual debate over what should be done with the garbage-lined shores of Dead Horse Bay, especially since the federal government acquired the bay in 1972 as part of a nearby national park, making it a federal crime to remove anything from the bay, including decaying and toxic garbage. It is illegal to remove artifacts from any national park site. The other thing is, you know, we're also tasked with preserving and protecting the waters under our control. So where is that balance? How do we explain to the public we're protecting historic trash? I've been taking my students to Dead Horse Bay since 1987. There's an interesting struggle that takes place on that beach. Just the nature of what's on the beach creates such a debate between everybody out there. Howard Warren, a retired science teacher, is the only person to acquire legal permission from the Park Service to remove artifacts from Dead Horse Bay. Over the years, he and his students built up an incredible collection at Manhattan's Trinity School, where each item is carefully studied and preserved to determine what life was like in 1953 Brooklyn. Howard calls it neo-archaeology, and the work has yielded some important discoveries. It was Howard and his students that first determined the age of the landfill, using partially decomposed newspapers, all dated between February and March of 1953. But after spending 30 years researching Dead Horse Bay, Howard has grown rather protective of this makeshift dumping site. There is a layer of history that is being stolen away from us. Local artists have taken artifacts from the bay and made these sculptures, and then those artists take those sculptures that are rich with artifacts to their studios or to their homes, and they're gone. These things belong to everybody, and even though it looks like a trash site, it's still federally protected. When I go out there, I go to people who are collecting and I explain that to them. I was there one day and there was a, an adult with a, what appeared to be a student. He came out at me and he said, uh, you know, stop what you're doing. It's a historical site and it should remain intact for future generations. 
I guess I, I'm 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 of the feeling that because it's a dump, it's a it's a landfill, and it's garbage. So if, if anything, I'm sort of doing I'm, I'm doing beach cleanup. Gerard isn't alone. Other pickers argue they are inadvertently conducting a beach cleanup and believe the park's current policy outlaws recycling. But since the artifacts treasure pickers glean from the beach are just the tip of a massive landfill beneath Dead Horse Bay, it's difficult to consider their efforts a true beach cleanup. A fact even Gerard acknowledges. I don't know how much I'm cleaning up, but it seems like some of it looks like lead, plastic, things that just don't fit in with nature. And he's right. Along with rusted metal and broken glass, thousands of lead batteries are buried at Dead Horse Bay, leaking their toxic contents into the tide, where it's common to find dead sea life washing ashore. It seems leaving historic garbage on the beach in any quantity is dangerous for wildlife. Underfunded and faced with a complex ecology, officials from Gateway National Recreation Area say there are no cleanup plans for Dead Horse Bay. Some point to London as a solution, where treasure hunters are encouraged to scavenge along the foreshore of the River Thames. Collectors there are free to bring their loot home, but are also incentivized to donate their findings to a local history museum. In a sense, it's crowdsourced archaeology that also cleans the shores. That's kind of a lovely creative way to solve the problem of what do we do with the stuff at Dead Horse Bay? I think a program that incentivizes people to collect artifacts and when they get tired of them, bring them to an institution is a good midway program. All of these artifacts tell a story about the tragedy that people had to go through when New York City and the United States was going through such change. So far, no cultural or historical institution has formed an official relationship with Dead Horse Bay, and its historic artifacts continue to flow into the tide. The bay, like the evicted residents who shaped it, remains largely forgotten. People need to care about Dead Horse Bay because we are there, ourself, our own very recent past is strewn across the beach. The people who preceded us here in the city who helped craft and create and build and run the city from the street level, their lives are strewn across the beach at Dead Horse Bay. And when we go there and walk amongst the ruins that were their material selves, their homes, their almost endless inventory of intimate objects that populated their lives, that's what's on the beach. And if we care about ourselves and our history, recent and long ago, we have to care about Dead Horse Bay. It's reflecting us back at ourselves. Thank you.